Hey there, welcome back to the Uncovered Dish Christian Leadership Podcast, the podcast that uncovers stories, equips leaders, and changes the world. And we are your hosts, James Lee. And Gabby Corbett. So today's guest is Dr. Sarah B. Drummond, who serves as the founding dean of Andover Newton Seminary at Yale Divinity School. She teaches and writes about leadership and serves as a combination advisor, minister, mentor to ministers in formation. She is also an ordained minister in the United Church of Christ. There is written five books on the subject of ministerial leadership, including titles such as Holy Clarity, The Practice and Planning, The Practice of Planning and Evaluation, which dives deep into the practice of transforming abstract theological concepts into concrete ministry programs and dynamic discernment, reason, emotion, and power, which offers an interdisciplinary approach to change, striking a balance between reason, emotion, and it's clear Sarah is a voice to be reckoned with in the realm of theological insights. Thank you so much, Sarah, for being on this pod- podcast. We're really glad to be you. Thank you, Gabby, and thank you, James. I'm so delighted to be with you today. So can you tell us who you are behind <laughs> all of your accomplishments? Yep. How did you get here? What has your path been like? What is the human journey beyond all of the things that we just read about you? Well, Gabby, I am a New Englander. I've lived here in New England and specifically Connecticut for much of my life. And I come from a close-knit family of people who came to the Christian faith from different directions and really as a matter of cultural practice. It wasn't an important part of their lives in a way that would suggest that their daughter would definitely become a pastor. I think about all the different stories that I could share with you about what makes me interested in what I'm interested in, how I was drawn into this work. Uh, But I think an object lesson that maybe would tell the story well quickly is that when I was in college, an undergrad in college, my favorite thing to do was staying up till two and three in the morning talking with friends. I love talking with people about the meaning of life. I love thinking about purpose and thinking about what we're called to do and and be. And my friendships were really important to me. And one time my roommate, my college roommate, Jean, said, Sarah, what you need is some job that involves talking about the meaning of life and organizing your desk. Organizing my desk was something that I used to do that sort of drove her crazy because we shared a room, we shared a bedroom for three years. And if she would put a coffee mug on my desk or move a pencil, I would get very cross with her. So she was actually criticizing me when she said, you need some job where you talk about the meaning meaning of life and then sit around all day and organize your desk. And I found a job where I think about the meaning of life and organize things on my desk all day, every day. There you go. There you go. Think about my dad, who's just retired. He was a seminary I, professor as well, and he said he he just loved to read books. And he said, "Wow, someone's going to pay me to study. <laughs> Somebody's going to pay me to organize my desk, James." It's a That's good exactly on. right, Sarah. <laughs> well, Sarah, um, I'm so glad that you are where you are, and also love to write in the way that you do because. Some of the books you uh, wrote have been really, really insightful, especially uh, Dynamic Discernment. I wish I read this when I was in seminary. Uh, (laughs) Some of these, I think about how we uh, view change as a problem. But in your book, you approach change as a dynamic rather than a problem. So can you say a bit about that, how you think about change uh, as a dynamic? Sure, James. Of course, I'm really tempted to change the subject to tell me about your dad. It sounds like an incredible story that you're in ministry and your dad's retired from this uh, this work, but for another day. I wrote Dynamic Discernment because I couldn't find a book to use in the classes that I was teaching about leadership that brought together multiple perspectives on a dynamic 
that is richly and deeply explored, but in several different fields. So reason, emotion, and power, the subtitle of the book, Dynamic Discernment, signifies three different schools of thought about what change is and how it happens. Reason comes mostly from the business world, where we see that change leadership takes the form of planning, of communicating, of setting goals, and then measuring how we're doing and achieving those goals. Emotion comes more from the world of social science, specifically emotional systems theory, which is a a body of theory that's touched every dimension of the social science world with the idea that people are not so much individuals as participants in a system. And if we can think systematically, think systemically, we can lead more effectively because we understand the interconnectedness of communities. Power comes from the world of uh, liberation theology, thinking about how oppression is invisible and yet omnipresent and to a certain extent can be managed, but also needs to be understood and respected as the invisible force that sometimes will prevent even the most life-giving change simply as power tries to sustain itself, protect its, its dominance. So this is a really brief summary of an entire book. Now, you asked the question about in what way is change more a, a um, dynamic than a problem to be solved? Right, right. I started studying change leadership about um, 30 years ago. And over the past 20 years, I've been writing about it. In those 20 years that I've been writing about change leadership, The field has moved significantly. And in fact, I like to joke that change is changing. Change is changing faster than change can keep up with. When I first started studying change leadership, it was understood as maybe a part of leadership, an occasional area of interest. So say a faith community will be sustained, status quo, all systems are go, And then maybe some external or internal disruption will take place and we need to lead amidst change. Now, I don't really need to say change leadership because that is leadership. It's all that leaders do. Change leadership is the job of the leader. And that just wasn't true when I first started on this path. So if change is just the water that we're swimming in, and we treat change like a problem, we're all going to be very discouraged because we're not striving towards some new homeostatic status quo. It doesn't exist. It's not going to, um, change is not going to decelerate in our lifetime. There's no evidence that change will do anything other than accelerate. The trusted definitions of change leadership that we all are relying on right now are models that suggest that there is some landing place. And James, Gabby, there is no landing place. So all we can really expect is that we're all going to be navigating destination unknown for the rest of our careers. So to seek resolution of that anxiety is going to depress us, it's going to de-energize us, and it's going to cause us to say that our very best leaders, the ones who are able to find a way to energize their communities in the midst of destination unknown, we're going to be telling them that they're failures. Because if resolving tension that leads us to change is a failure, we're all going to fail. Wow, wow, wow. You know, and we see change all around us. You know, Uh I know during the pandemic, they say that within the first six months, we saw five years worth of technological change happen. And we see industries change all over. But for some reason, I believe change seems to be harder in the church. There seems to be more of these uh, interconnectedness with people. There's a lot of emotion that is tied into uh, that which we care about in our spirituality. But why do you think change is so hard in the church? Some of the things we love the most about church, 
relate to that which transcends time and transcends change. God is immutable. Jesus's love for us cannot be interrupted, canceled, diminished. People come to church because they want to be part of something that's bigger than themselves. And sometimes that bigger thing is a tradition, is a physical sanctuary, is a ritual practice that was practiced before they were born and will be practiced, we pray, after we're, we're gone. Those are beautiful impulses. And if you tell somebody that for no good reason you're about to take some of those treasures away from them, they will fight you. And God bless them, they should. They should. So often I hear ministers criticize their congregation as um, as being stuck in the past. And then they use this example of people in the congregation who say, well, we've always done it that way before. I admonish my students. I tell my students, I never want to hear that expression come out of your mouth. Never. Because if a person tells you, we've always done it this way before, they're saying We've always done it that way before, and we're scared you're going to screw it up. We're scared that you don't understand why this is so important to us. We're scared that you would throw out the baby with the bathwater if we let you. If a congregation is saying that to you, it's because you need to work harder on building trust with them. It doesn't need, mean that you need to keep things the same. It means that they need to trust that this cherished thing is as important to you as it is to them. So it doesn't mean that we don't get frustrated at the pace of change or frustrated when we need to move quickly to change something that has been a cherished ritual in service of another cherished thing that's really just as important. It doesn't mean we don't get frustrated, but change is hard because what we're talking about changing is to many people transcendent. And mm, wow. we need to take a lot of time and attention to help people understand reason, reason, help people understand why a change is in the best interest of the bigger thing, the best interest of the loftier thing. We need to honor the fact that nobody is as smart as the system, the emotional system is strong, meaning don't even think about underestimating how the ripples of a, of a change might disrupt beyond what would seem um, obvious and apparent from the beginning. And finally, remember that a change needs to honor the power dynamics, identifying the shared goals between the systems that have power and the life of the community that's being lived right now. We do this in real time. It's not like I expect that a person is going to sit down and make a list of all of the different steps I just made, but I think we can train our instincts toward not just implementing a change because we're in charge. Nobody cares that you're in charge. They don't care. What they care about is, does this change make sense? Have you honored the feelings that are likely to ripple out? And have you thought in advance about how to non-anxiously soothe those tensions? And have you consulted with those who could ruin your idea like that because of the power that they hold? It's not easy, but it's also, it, it's, it's not easy, but it's, it's just not surprising to me. Maybe it's not surprising to me anymore. But it's not surprising to me that change requires a multivalent um, set of attentions. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. How, so how do you do that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's certain things that I named. So I wrote this book that James and Gabby might not have read yet, or maybe you read it and you like the other one better. But my book, Intentional Leadership, really was a book that I wrote because I was getting that question a lot. How do you do that? Intentional Leadership is a leadership book that's built for people who do not have a true north 
that they can simply point to and just start rowing where they really have to hold a community in place as God's will for that community becomes better known because really what they're trying to do is keep the community together in a time of great uncertainty. Why do I bring up that book now? Well, because I think that our old models of what change leadership means build into them unrealistic expectations for leaders. If we believe that a leader has the job of get us from here to there and nobody agrees on what is there, they're not even totally sure they agree on what is here, it's a setup. It's a setup. So intentional leadership, I make the argument that what the leader has to do is find ways to find internal isometric balance among the different opposing forces that would set them off one direction over another. So here's an example. The tension between planning and improvisational openness. We all know that worship that feels chaotic doesn't cause people to feel held. If a person comes into worship and it's just anything goes and we could be here for five hours or for five minutes and I don't know, we know that people don't feel safe. They don't feel like their traditions being honored. They don't know what they're going to get in a, in, in a bad way. We also know that worship that is stuck in the mud where it's you know, we're married to the bulletin and we are all sitting there ramrod straight, afraid to breathe or sneeze. That doesn't feel good either. So how do we find the right balance? That's just one example, but I name in the book, I name five. And the reason I'm, I'm commending it is that I think we need to recognize the ways in which success was defined by this goal-oriented change leadership model. And that goal-oriented change leadership model does not work right now. Wow. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> I think we're seeing that immensely uh, as things have changed, especially post-pandemic slash in the pandemic slash whatever world we're living in right now. And I think it's really important for us to look at different models of leadership and change leadership. Um, especially as, you know, James and I are fairly young in ministry. Uh, and what does that look like when, you know, 20 years ago, we thought we knew what the church would look like in 20 years. And who knows what the church will look like 20 years from now. And how do we build up leadership that is excited about that and who's willing to take on what church could be, what the community and the kingdom of God looks like if it doesn't look the way that it's always. Yeah. Well, what really excites me coming out of the pandemic is that what you're naming are patterns and trends that I and my colleagues in the study of ministerial leadership have been talking about for 20 years, but people didn't believe us. The, the idea of change being the norm. So it's not we're changing so that we could arrive somewhere, but it's just that change is just a part of leadership uh, is is also a little terrifying, right? Uh, it, it is going to feel a little uns unsettling and perhaps chaotic. And I know we're just kind of jumping from book to book, but the reality is, is uh, these are very powerful books. And I do want to jump to a uh, holy clarity for a moment, because in that book, you describe the importance of um, the practices of planning and evaluation and ultimately having clarity in church leadership. And so uh, that's one thing that gives me a little hope, right? Okay, so we still, there's this drive towards, there is a way to find clarity in the midst of the, the uncertainties and the changes. And so uh, why does clarity matter uh, for effective ministry? And uh, what do church leaders need to do to gain clarity? Oh. Holy Clarity is the title that my publisher helped me choose for my first book. And after the book came out, my husband, who is a Marvel guy, not a DC guy, pointed out that 
It should have been called Holy Clarity Batman. And ever since, ever since he pointed that out, it's all I can hear when I hear somebody say the name Holy Clarity. So if I chuckle every time you say the name, I'm going to think about Batman and Robin. Holy Clarity, Batman. And tell you that the, the reasoning behind the book was that administrative leadership in congregations, in uh, faith communities, in any community that seeks transformation as its bottom line, the transformation of a community, the transformation of human souls, that we're dealing in this nebulous territory. And that means that we might all fall prey to having differing understandings of the reason we're doing what we're doing. And I make the argument that there is evidence in our Christian tradition, in our heritage, and in scripture that God is pleased when we take that which is murky and we find clarity, that there's something really sacred about that practice. So what I write about in Holy Clarity is that if we were to try to come up with a rationale for evaluation and for planning, it's that God is happy when we take that which is unclear and we make it clear. We see that in the prophets. We see that in all of the healing miracles, particularly the blindness healing miracles. And I think we sense it intuitively that when we come together with a group of people who might all have different ideas of what's the point of having a stewardship campaign, what's the point of celebrating worship? And you actually find out that you all think it's important, but maybe for very different reasons, the relationship becomes healthier and closer and you find it easier to work together. So that's why I wrote the book. And the book really is about how do we find a theological rationale for knowing what we're doing? We're constantly criticizing people. Oh, she doesn't know what she's doing. They don't know what they're doing. Well, let's fix that. Let's know what we're doing. And um, start to recognize that as we come to a shared consensus about the purpose of our most um, sh- our most uh, precious practices, we actually grow in our faith as we do that. Can, can you talk a little bit about um, the evaluation part too? I per- I am particularly sure. inclined to this today because I just had a conversation with my district superintendent about how to do evaluation well. <laughs> and so I would just be interested to hear, you know, what is, you know, why is evaluation so important for church leadership and how does that sort of help us navigate this clarity change dynamic? Evaluation is a word that strikes fear into the hearts of many. And that to me is a wasted opportunity and a waste of energy. We engage in evaluative practice all the time just by being a reasoning human being a formal evaluation i think is best is best when it takes the anecdotal and incidental conversations that we're having anyway and simply builds a summary and names future directions when churches that don't engage in any kind of evaluate evaluative conversation about anything suddenly decide that they're going to evaluate their pastor, they got no muscles. They got no muscles and they tend to be very, very bad at it and feelings get hurt. A simple way to organize an evaluation of say, say you want to say you wanted to create an evaluation of your um, lay leaders. So imagine that you wanted to, um, you wanted the lay leaders to engage in some kind of Um, self-evaluation in order to set good goals for the future, right? So the first step is that you need to set criteria, criteria. And I'm obsessed with criteria because I think that this is the step that you skip to your peril. Feelings always get hurt if you don't clarify the criteria. So if you clarify that that um, the criteria that we're looking for is do people in the congregation feel like they, they, do they find the lay leaders approachable? Do they believe that the lay leaders have the best interest of the church at heart? Do they they participate in the forms of leadership that are expected in a way that is um, 
is enhancing the ministry of the whole people of God. You know, so I'm saying like, come up with like three criteria, four criteria before they do an, an ounce of work. These criteria have to be clear before they actually are doing the job. Then after they've been doing the job, you gather data that are relevant to those specific criteria and nothing else. You don't get to introduce new criteria at that point. Why? Because that was not the basis for the evaluation upon which folks agreed. If you try to establish the criteria with the rear, like with the work in the rear view mirror, it's just mean. It's just mean. Nobody's going to learn anything. Finally, I'll say that the best evaluations are ones that are designed to, for the sake of learning, not for the sake of punishing, not for the sake of passing judgment. When you hear that a clergy member is maybe not as successful as they ought to be and we're going to conduct an evaluation, my thought is you're just too late. You're just too late. You could say we're going to plan an intervention here. We're going to have some kind of intervention and do a reset and give a timeline um, and then say, okay, in the intervention, we're going to name the criteria that we didn't have the good sense to name previously because we didn't know how important they would be or we had no idea you were capable of screwing that up. That happens too. We can have an intervention where we say, this is now something we're articulating is very important and you've got six months. We're going to look at this again. Here's an example. A lay leader is told in an evaluation that they are not talking to everybody at coffee hour. That had never been an expectation. Well, now we have an intervention. And before we conduct some kind of evaluation, we're going to tell you that's actually a really important thing to do. Whether it is or not, it's just an example. But what, you're, what I'm saying is that you introduced that as something that I didn't realize how important that was. I kind of thought that you would have figured that out on your own. Shame on me. We live in a really diverse community and not everybody was raised the same way. Not even at any, you might never even have gone to coffee hour in your previous life. So we do the intervention and then the valuation comes with adequate time to address the lacuna that's there. Much more generous, much more, much more reasonable, and also frankly, just much less crazy. It's crazy to expect people to know things that nobody ever told them before. We are all so different from each other now. We all were raised so differently from each other. So um, you also write about finding the theological foundations of church practices, which I think is really important. So what is, for those who maybe haven't read your work yet or just kind of coming to the table to understand what you bring to the table, what is the faith practices approach? And how does it differ from other approaches to planning and evaluation? So Diana Butler Bass uses this expression, traditioning traditioning like a verb. And traditioning is when a congregation or a faith community embraces a age-old practice and discovers it anew. So you might think of churches that have decided to install labyrinths in the past couple of decades. So a labyrinth is an ancient Celtic practice and no Christians did it for like 500, 600 years. And we reclaim part of our tradition and look at the cool things that can happen when we do that. So that's traditioning. I take traditioning in a slightly different direction as a leadership practice, and I make it much less glamorous than Diana Butler Bass, who is like a, way smarter than me. So I make it much more my speed, which is to define it in terms of why did we ever start doing this in the first place? That why did we ever start doing this in the first place question gets us past practices and into our theology. And there's nothing wrong with practices that have become untethered from their underlying theology. There are ways in which practices do take on a life of their own. And yet, conflict tends to follow when a community has very different understandings of the meaning and purpose of something they're doing and they're attempting to update or make a change and no one really understands why we were ever doing something in the first place. So here's an example. Right, right. 
the New Century Hymnal is the bane of the existence of many UCC congregations. Now, I'm talking to Methodists, so I can say whatever I want about the UCC. I thought the hymnal was an abomination. I can't stand the changes to hymns that were published in the New Century Hymnal. And I am uh, of a generation where I technically am way too young to have felt that way. So I'm not a young person now, but when the New Century Hymnal came out, I was just finishing seminary and I hated it. Why? Because every hymn has this three letter curse word at the end of it, A-L-T, alt, because all the hymns were chlorinated for social justice concerns in ways that made the hymns less pretty. And not only were they less pretty, they also were less well-written, and I'm a snob. They also were making changes around gender, gender um, nomenclature in ways that I, as a whatever wave feminist I am, was like, don't do me any favors, dude. Like, I don't need you to do that for me. Don't you tell me what I need to sing and not sing. I was aligned with all of the nanogenarians in my congregation in that I didn't like the new hymnal. They and I disliked it for different reasons. I didn't like it because the hymns weren't beautiful anymore in terms of the lyricism of the writing. They didn't like it because they're old. They can't see the hymnal anymore and they know the hymns. They memorize them. So I'm telling them that now they are supposed to not sing the words that they literally know by heart, that are written on their heart. So this gives way to a conversation about what is the point of congregational singing. And that's where the evaluative practice gets really interesting because I don't like being required to sing words that are poorly written. These congregants who had the hymns uh, memorized liked the way in which everybody felt connected, whether they could see or not. And they felt connected with their parents and their grandparents and their heritage. The evaluative practice is us sitting and talking about what does congregational singing mean to us? You don't have the conversation and people are just mad. They're just mad. And I was mad. And I was shocked by my own response. Now, my mentor, uh, in uh, the senior minister under whom I was serving, and a mentor named Dudley Rose, his critique was that the New Century Hymnal did a great job with the imminence, but a pretty crummy job with the transcendence. So in order to sound smart, that's what I would say, or that's what I do say now. But really, I just didn't like it because I thought it was ugly. And it raised really important questions about the practice of our faith. So in higher education language, we would say um, principles over practice, that the principle is I'm trying to teach the kid, not um, you need to teach math this way, that way, or the other way. It's I want to teach this kid. That's the principle mode. With us, we rely on our theology. <laughs> well, lay it on me. What's your last question? <laughs> All right. So our last question is, uh, if you can have one dish for the rest of your life, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, no variations, what would that one dish be? It's a very cruel, cruel question, James, because I love food, but I'm going to have to say I would have to go with mujadra, which is Lebanese-style lentils, food of the gods. Food of the gods. I love, love it. it. I love it. <laughs> so where, where can you get it? Where's the best place to go for it? Best place to get it would be 67 Marburn Drive, which is where I grew up in Suffield, Connecticut. There you go. Jackie Joseph <laughs> Birmingham. My mom makes the best mujadra in the history. There you go. Mujadra. Next time we'll meet in Connecticut and we'll have a dish. Sounds good. Thank, Thank you, Sarah. Thank you so much. And uh, folks, if you wanted to find out more about Sarah, go to uh, sarahbdrummond.com. 
Yes, Sarah, and we'll we'll talk to you again soon. Take care. Thank you so much.